Hi everyone. Thanks, it's snowing again. So I'm really pleased this evening to introduce Francesca Hughes to MIT, who's braved the weather. Uh, Francesca is an architect, a teacher, and a writer based in London, and she's uh, taught for the last several years at the Bartlett and the AA. Uh, and she's currently on a book tour of her new book, The Architecture of Error, Matter, Measure, and the Misadventure of Precision, published by MIT Press. And we're fortunate to catch her on our tour between the GSD, Princeton, and Yale. Francesca is the founding partner of Hughes Meyer Studios, a transdisciplinary practice whose projects really span publication, exhibition, and artworks. Her current project, uh, Piano Falling, is a collaboration with video artist Catherine Yass and sound designer Deb David Shepard. And my understanding is in the development of this project, it had nothing to do with our Baker House famous alto dorm um, uh, piano drop, which happens every year. Uh, so Francesca's project, they're dropping a piano for four seconds, so it means it's coming off a 27-story building and recording the sound as that piano falls. Um, as a teacher, Francesca's studios are known for producing large-scale drawings that address construction in context of architecture. I received a copy of her beautiful book, Drawings That Count. Uh, here, count is referring to the verb to count, as opposed to uh, referring to importance. And it's a collection of a decade's worth of beautiful representations by uh, students at, at the AA. As a writer and critic, Francesca's work really bridges uh, architecture criticism and design discourse and addresses social and technical issues in the discipline and the tensions between. Her edited publication, The Architect, Reconstructing Her Practice, published in 1998 by MIT Press, collected essays from 12 female architects and reflected on the absence of women in the profession uh, and defined critical practice as a site uh, and vehicle for change. Today, Francesca will present her new book, The Architecture of Error, which addresses the architect's relationship to and the tension around ever-increasing desire for precision. The book is at once a kind of historical experiment, recasting technology through the lens of error, precision, and its lack thereof. With that, I'd like to welcome Francesca. I'm sorry, oh, it is on there. Okay. Um, and the, I might just stand up so I can see you. Um, the, the kind of, the weather was perfect for the purpose of this book in that I flew from London in a plane that was probably flown by a computer and was certainly landed by a computer in the kind of crosswind and blizzard on Monday night. And the plane was able to get up to the gate and then three meters from the gate had to stop because it couldn't dock because there was a bit of snow in the way of the reflective the docking mechanism. So a guy had to get out with a shovel, move the snow, so that the plane could dock. The point being there was all this kind of incredible um, precision available for, every, for the getting the plane here, but the final bit um, required a different kind of intervention. So it's a great pleasure to be here to talk about this book. Um, it's a great honor to be publishing it with MIT Press. I don't know how involved the department is with the press, but it, as you know, it's, it's a very special press. Um, so I want to start with Hook, Robert Hook in 1665, putting what he calls his most precise instrument, um, which is the needle on his compass, underneath the then 50-fold magnification of his microscope. He writes in his book that it was a million-fold in bulk, but that was a bit of an exaggeration. It was actually just 50-fold. And he finds to his great horror that it's not a smooth, sharp point, but it's broad, blunt, and very irregular, as he writes, 
marked with the rudeness and bungling of art, that is, the bungling of the skill, the technology that made it. And pulling back from the microscope and looking at this compass point that again had become precise and sharp looking, he says, how much therefore can be built upon demonstrations made only by the production of the ruler and compass? He will be but better able to consider that shall but view those points and lines with the microscope. So if you think Hooke a few years after that was when a Newton was going to swing their compasses and rebuild far torn London. So the error Hooke discovers on his needle point that is the subject of this book here is not the epic error of catastrophe of Tacoma Bridge, which I think some of the students were showing this afternoon. Sorry, here it is again. It's not the kind of seminal error of acute structural collapse, nor the kind of performative failures, say, of modernism and some of the ambivalent legacy of its urbanism, nor am I talking about the errors of syntax and the kind of playful misreadings of Eisenman's Romeo and Juliet nor the aesthetic errori of Vasari's artists that stray from the two path, the true path, nor does it directly regard the kind of erroneous forms of the monstrous that pertains to the ugly, um, nor indeed the ethical errors delineated by morality, those we shall see these last two are never far behind any physical error. What I'm addressing here and what I'm trying to kind of focus on in this book is the micro and minor in every sense physical error that plagues all materialization. This is not to say that such an error is insignificant. The humble, almost kind of negligible error has, unlike, unlike, not unlike its ethical counterpart, this kind of infinite capacity to grow, to expand in its effect, as any theologian would argue. And in a sense, perhaps that's what Tacoma demonstrated, a small thing ending up having a big effect. And it's against this symbolic threat that the digital dimension of several decimal places, like the sharpened pencil points beforehand, stand right. So Hooke's scope, like Alberti's window, as we now know, was installed in the computer. We zoom out and error disappears. But like Hooke, we know it's still there. And this is Sutherland's, I'm, I'm really bringing calls to Newcastle, it's really embarrassing coming to MIT and talking to you about the beginnings of the computer. But Perhaps you haven't heard this, this kind of version of it. This is Sutherland's 1962 sketch pad. I'd like another one in there. So I put picture within a picture within a picture idea. Right, it's real nightmare material. It's every time that over, even though the spot sort of disappears, uh, it's really still there. So, nightmare material. It's behind the window that the operative in this film um, perhaps names for the first time is also installed a very large piece of paper. I'm sorry, if we regard this as a window that we can move over our paper and, and enlarge the size of this window, we can uh, I imagine the computer has a fixed sheet of paper behind this window. This scale is approximately two miles inside. Two miles. I love I love the kind of hovering hand of hesitation and doubt. Just, He's about to call it a window and call the thing behind a big piece of paper. He's, he's just got to have pluck up the guts to do it. So this piece of paper is obviously now about 14 million miles wide on the side, with the possibility of drawing to a 10,000th of an inch in precision no matter where one draws on it. The vertiginous void, then, that Hooke felt himself falling through as he peered down through his microscope and the accuracy gap he saw opening up between its magnification and that of the naked eye is not dissimilar to that which now opens up between the electronic drawing and the setting out on sight, in the mind, in the rain, by different gloved hands of the walls we draw. When Matta Clark took a jigsaw to cut a section through the suburban house, he was, amongst other things, already making a mockery, himself an architect, of the architect's then immaculate drafting film and .18 pen. And as the films of his unbuilding works reveal, he worked with zero margin for error, that is, with zero redundant precision also, and there is no drawing because he is the drawing. And thus he has the ability to respond live, to improvise and to respond to the, to the material feedback. So he's now knocking out the top course of the foundation wall so that the house can split apart, tip apart. Um, he gets the last bit out and has to jump and catch as the house tips 
beyond expectation. This is kind of Harold Lloyd. You know, this is not what architects do. The Baroque invisible architecture of margins for error that once traced its way through the paper drawing is rendered all the more complex in the digital drawing and now in digital fabrication. So now that we have the ability to calculate perfection using no more or less gas than approximation, which is kind of not true because approximation actually uses more gas, is it not time to ask what does this mean? What exactly does this do to the relations between the calculated and the drawn? the materialized, digitally fabricated, or conventionally. Is this something that we want? The fetishization of precision in architectural culture and our kind of peculiar addiction to precision was testifying to a set of relations that are anything but transparent also silences our critical interrogation of its inbuilt redundancy. Or the interrogation simply bounces off, like the Newtonian optics in this rendering software. And I'm choosing this drawing from all the very shiny drawings out there, because this one's so shiny, it's kind of wet almost. Um, it's, it's really, you don't need to know much about fetishism or Freud to understand this is fetishistic. Um, let's just at least say so saturated is its resolution that it kind of drips precision, which is. To say what I'm trying to do with this book is to invite the reader, the architectural reader at least, to think precisely about precision. But the problem with that is twofold. Firstly, it neglects to observe that the term precision itself is eminently imprecise, kind of unstable and kind of promiscuous term. And secondly, it, further, it fails to take into account the fact that the architect's relations to precision are already congenitally imprecise. Indeed, one might well ask, what does it say about the insecurities of architecture's productive culture that when we get a hold of the incredible computational power, we use it to produce very shiny drawings? But this new surface, defined solely by its optical performance, most radically cleaves interiority from exteriority. Any interrogation, as I said, bounces off. And it says we might even argue um, that this surface excess of redundant precision has become the ornament of today. But there is, of course, another layer to the threat physical error has always constituted, and its origins are to be found in the metaphysics, in Aristotle's conflation of error with matter and level form. So here we have the Cohen brothers at their very best. I'm actually going to keep the volume down. With their Aristotelian wood chipper, and in Aristotle, Aristotle's terms, the composite of this poor chapped leg has been pushed through, and form is being deleted, and its materiality is being rendered back into matter. Whereas Marg, the pregnant cop, if you know the movie, um, is obviously busy doing the opposite. So in Aristotle, error emerges as both a possible agent of matter, and curiously, its only physical formal register. It then follows that any elaboration of error as an active category within architecture can potentially access that most evasive category, matter itself, while avoiding some of the traps of fetishization the 20th century fell for. But this also means that physical error embodies everything Aristotle assigns to matter, a complex interception of indeterminacy, difference, existence, literally matter lends existence, interiority, process, labor is installed in matter in Aristotle, and entropy. When things go wrong, it's because of matter. It follows that any elaboration of error as a category is necessarily a critique also of the interest that precision may be in service to. That is, the question of error is always unavoidably political. Aristotle's schema installs the questions we still do not ask, can something be too precise, for instance, the properties we still fear, and the degenerate other that we still, while keeping hidden, conversely always use to define what we are and what we do. Instituted in architectural practice behind the complex methodological fortifications erected to protect against material error, margins for error, tolerance, standards and specifications, uh, material failure thresholds, and so on, lie the more systemic defenses that we employ, metaphoricity, inference, the kind of ideological colonization of the vacuums that technical indeterminacy always leaves but never quite fully declares. And of course, the many epistemic models we deploy. But the architect has developed precocious tools for managing his unique fear of physical error. 
And collectively, these defenses ensure that almost any error that gets through it is effectively neutralized. Just as when artists talk about their work, we learn not so much about how they work, but about the delusions under which they work. When architects talk about how precise a drawing is, a detail of a material system, something we can frequently and automatically do, especially in education, we betray, like Foucault's unwitting subject, our delusion that, here quoting Foucault, words had kept their meaning, that desires still pointed in a single direction, and that ideas retained their logic. But the logic that we're assuming that organizes the relations between precision and its control of material error in architectural cultural production has long since unraveled. Precision quite simply no longer does what it says in the tin. Its desires are an altogether different course. So we find precision then to be yet another unspoken obsession of modernism subject to fetishization and inflation, and preserved by multiple institutional practices. Indeed, architectural culture's very special fear of error constitutes a powerful undertow in all of its relations to the processes of materialization. That is, the brick's wall, the brick wall, once drawn with precisely judged approximation, has become a methodological absurdity that nonetheless strangely doesn't seem to embarrass us. In a sense, quite contrary, we exalt in its exactitude. So here's someone that exalted in exactitude, Conrad Rochman, um, with these extraordinary drawings, pre-digital drawings. Um, and in a sense, what these throw up is the question in is of, of how are we to understand the function of redundant precision. Rochman, whilst pursuing precision beyond the limits of constructability, also claimed to be stripping architecture of redundant of all redundancy. But clearly, redundant precision kind of didn't count within his equation. So one needs to ask at this point, in a sense, it's there to do what exactly? How much of it is about some other undeclared imperative that is not only driving the fetishization of the apparently precise in architectural culture, but also the strange reverse engineering of play in the terms tolerance and materiality, so central to architectural practice. Like Hook, if we zoom in on our current generation of scopes, we find that things also do not join up quite as smoothly as we thought they did. In the last 100 years, a no man's land has opened up between precision and material error control, in which not only is the meaning of these terms far from stable, but the relations that govern our tolerance to material behavior have reached a point of acute crisis. So in this book, what I'm attempting to do is to navigate this shifting landscape, and in doing so, map the unraveling of the logic upon which so much once hung. Indeed, the rise of precision, and by implication, its, its kind of presumed control of error, like a ghost, shadows the narratives that organize stitching, that kind of stitch together, in a sense, the removal of ornament from one end of the century to the fabrication, digital fabrication, directed by a regulatory network at the other end of the century. What these narratives don't tell us is that precision and error relations were fundamentally transformed through each of modernism's seminal crises. So what if we were add to the kind of familiar formulae, the kind of litany of um, historiographic mantra that govern our relations to what we call modernism, the materials got more honest, ornament was removed, solid became ephemeral, and so on, close pad opened that, in a sense, things just got more and more precise. Or we might add that the more we cornered error, the more we feared it. And as things got more precise, we find precision broke away from error mitigation altogether, from truthfulness even, and became something <coughs> else. And with this, so too did error. Otherwise put, what if we were to consider the key cultural and technological crises architecture underwent in the last hundred years as moments of intensification of, its deep, of a deep-seated fear in error? We find that the rejection of organic materials did not just produce the steel and glass experiments by Mies and Shero that we know so well, but produced a whole generation of aircraft whose newly metal wings meant they were just too heavy to take off, too heavy to ever fly. 
that, that as the construction industry struggled to harness the incredible potential of concrete, but concrete's double-edged sword, let's say, the, the incredible potential on the one hand meant it would pour instant, cheap, fast architecture into being. On the other hand, meant that it had an incredible capacity to generate an expensive mess that had gone horribly wrong. And in a sense, what one starts to see is that it was almost the fear of this material that was liquid, thus had a kind of automated intelligence of its own, chemically active, opaque, viscous, that drove the frenzied erection of standards and specifications, which then changed everything. Under this new regime, material error merged with labour error, which is utterly Aristotelian. Aristotle was there in the concrete building sites of kind of 1890, 1910 America. Um, but also that construction as a space of synthesis and negotiation with error was done away with. And thus we might consider that the flow of slurry paved the way for the flow of data. As Le Corbusier's house that could be poured in three days, as Le Corbusier says, erected the rhetorical infrastructure of the even more instantaneous and thus even more immaculate form finding that was to arise some hundred years later. We find too that the territory this regime eclipses, the very territory that Matt Clark with his unbuilding project takes us back to, which is in a sense the unstable middle ground of production and form and matter are still in negotiation and error once right. Um, that this territory that is eclipsed is also the territory which is, is, it is the job of any morphogenetic model to like a bridge promise safe passage across as did that of Samuel Thomas Somering, who in 1799 was finally able to invent the modern fetus. Um, and the fetus up to that point had kind of resisted representation, indeed had threatened to undo representation, and Somering's solution to kind of finally pin down the kind of the plotting, as it were, of the morphogenesis of the fetus was to instruct his anatomy artist not to draw in perspectival space, but to draw as architects, as he directs in the in Iconos, that is to plot and survey and draw in the space of parallel projection, in the space of buildings, this morphogenesis, which became a contract between form and matter and time, whose metaphoric currency would protect all against such polymorphous <coughs> indeterminacy. And lastly, we find that not unlike that first digital architect, Owen Schrodinger, who's up with his architect, Gene. And Duchess, too, in his desire to be rid of error, fast realized that it's by installing power, not in the giant, but in the miniature, that was to become code, that architecture's already precocious tools for managing its unique fear of physical error would redefine precision's relations to truthfulness. So now that the disciplining actions once held within the concept have been rehoused within the rubric of the regulatory network, what then are the fears and anxieties that we might have inadvertently installed in our current use of the computer? Which is not to argue some Luddite position, far from it, but to argue for a critical interrogation of the ways in which we've chosen to develop a hallucinatory cap capacity for precision that the computer can so glibly lays at our feet. And that is which, with whichever kind of productive paradigm employed. As we trade causal linearity for more systematized modes of production, the fear of error, like the error itself, to quote that nice chap with the nightmare material that we saw earlier, although we can't see it, it's still there. So as error mutates into the next new thing we don't want, which is what error will always do, the next new deviation that outwits architecture's ever augmented corrective measures, what are the new byproducts of our fear? Indeed, architecture's facility for correction is exactly what led to the metal aircrafts that couldn't fly, as we shall see. And more recently, has led to numerous projects that can't be wrong because, as the name says, they are optimized. And I thought it might be interesting for you to see some 1965 a computer produced this plan for a city of the future by processing the individual desires of half a million people for different types of homes, methods of transport, patterns of leisure and of work. 
together with the expected population growth and the resources available. But the computer could only offer a series of mathematical concepts. It is to the degree that we understand this powerful tool and how best to use it that we can gain the maximum possible benefit. For only men and women can ensure that this city of the future will be a place of beauty and tranquility. Pink Skyed IBM World from 1965. So, how are we to understand precision outside of its duty to exclude error, now potentially uncoupled from its contract with truthfulness? Not surprisingly, we find these answers, or these questions, in a sense, more intelligently addressed, not by those who optimize, but by, the, by those who explore failure and its artifactual debris. In the revisionist studies in STS, in the history of science and life sciences by Eric Schatzberg's work on aeroplanes, Amy Slayton's work on concrete, Nancy Cartwright's seminal kind of work on the life sciences, sorry, Nancy Cartwright's seminal work on the um, history of science on Hooke's Law, and Evelyn Fox Keller's work in the life sciences. But also in the several seminal art practices which expose a more uh, as well as a more critical economy of precision and error. Hepworth's technical notes on how she would carve her way around the floors and the stone that she was carving, for instance, but also how she'd negotiate other floors in her life with her kind of retreat to abstraction. Gordon Matter Clark, we've touched upon already. Uh, Rachel Whitetree, with her kind of strategic delegation to the liquid intelligence of the casting process, to this kind of automation. Uh, Georges Perec who will come to you again in a moment, use of the algorithm, not only to generate through constraint, which trick we all well know, but also to explore the Baroque redundancy of its precision generates, perhaps something architects are yet to do. And via Salmens, who, like Georges Perret, mimics the digital in her almost automated analog flattening, as she indexically doubles the surfaces of the desert, the sky, the moon, and so on. But I want to return to the lessons of the failed artifact, perhaps the most poignant of which is the engineer Dodos in this kind of first generation of, of aircraft, which came about with aviation engineers' full-scale adaptation of architecture's rejection of organic materials. And it's interesting, we always dwell on what we import from science and from technology. In a sense, perhaps it's telling at this point to look at what we export and the consequences of what we export. So during the interwar period, the symbolic conflation of flight and wood became as if overnight intolerable, and the very, very effective, um, successful spruce and linen aircraft was rebuilt in Duralumen, as all aeronautical engineers abandoned strong, durable, cheap, light timber for strong, durable, expensive, heavy metal. So in a sense, one wants to ask, what is it that suddenly became so repulsive about the conflation of flight and wood to the new modern mind the better a generation of metal, uh, metal airplanes so massive they could barely carry a pilot, let alone fuel or let alone ordnance as the war for the war to come. So here we have the very sad, bit more inflexible, these kind of incredible um, albatross-like wings, not soaring the skies but pottering around a muddy field in Norfolk. And they're kind of similar planes. None of them had these amazing wings there, the Galibay DB1 and so on. Similarly engineered dodos. All the more ironic, given this, isn't it? This is what we're taught. If you remember, Werner Stachur is full of pictures of airplanes. How did this emblem of all that is rational become so illogical, so surreally absurd, as McDermott points out in the kind of aviation journal at the time, it was the finger of science that pointed to the metal air to metal in the airplane construction. McDermott's rhetorical finger is clearly divine. Buildings and bridges were now steel, even boats were steel. It was destiny that planes were next to be reborn metallic. For one, as he goes on to say, we can no longer trust wood. The behavior of metal, on the other hand, was predictable and was curiously aligned with transparent accountability, faithfulness, and ultimate truth. So note how predictability delivers truthfulness, and <coughs> as a kind of flip of that, unpredictability delivers erroneousness. That's erroneousness. 
The potent characterization of the materials that this embodies is, of course, very familiar to architects. We invented it, we exported it. Not only is wood the deceitful harbor of error, literally in the Corpus's famous formulation, in the old world timber beam there may be lurking some treacherous knot, whereas the Corbusier again still girders the more recently reformed reinforced concrete are pure manifestations of calculations as stress strain calculations. Hooke's law rendered physical, a manifestation of almost pure form. So as we well know, metal came to stand for the unchallenged triangulation of precision, predictability, and truth, a word came to stand as it anathema. But these aircraft that could not fly ask difficult questions about technological instrumentalism, about how it conceals the indeterminacy latent in any material technology, and how it thus provides, provides a kind of opportunity for ideological insertion. Wood does not lie, metal does not tell the truth. Yet these planes, these early planes that couldn't fly, were deemed more valuable, su more superior, more, uh, superior to the wooden ones that could because they represented a newly metallic, error-free reality, which was great unless you needed to fly. So time and again, the workshop floor failed to confirm the arguments of Metal's proponents, as rhetoric and material would not match. The results of buckling tests, um, in a sense, were the most convincing art argument for spruce and for plier. So the results, the, the results of the famous Lockheed Vega tests were suppressed, American government stopped funding wood glue research. Stiffening features were quietly added, such as corrugation, rendering the aircraft, of course, heavier, more expensive, and slower to make. And what's important to kind of understand is that for aviation engineers accustomed to working with wood, so accustomed to working with a minimum margin for error and pu pushing back against deformation, really in the sense stretching the behavior of the material being suddenly required to kind of pull back from that point and remain within the elastic zone, so it's the kind of comfort zone of metal, constituted a kind of radical change in their relations to material behavior and to material precision. That is, it was metal with its ideological embodiment of all that is precise that fattened up the margins and planted the first structural redundancy in the quintessential engineered aircraft. Metal was pushed through by the interests of the military industrial complex, of course, the metal triangle after all, but also by a reasonable man under what was understood as the spell of metal. Metal had become almost not a material, but calculation itself. Not only that which stands for the truth by predictability, but also that which is both able to explain and to be explained. In bypassing the phenomenological, and promising direct representation of the theoretical, metal is singularly able to collapse what is observable on the one hand with that which is not meant to be observable, with the fundamental. So, in a sense, metal occupies this kind of unique position in being able to directly represent the fundamental law that is behind material behavior that is meant to govern material behavior. And obviously, fundamental laws make no errors. Thus, metal was crucially and epistemologically separated from error. But recombining description and explanation is not without conflict. Explanatory power often comes at a price, and sometimes it's truth itself. So Ptolemaic astronomy being a classic example, inference assumes a causality where there is none. These flightless aircraft then plot the undeclared space of technical indeterminacy and instrumentalism that's always already contaminated by culture. Yet how often, since Le Corbusier's famous lesson that we saw earlier, have architects deployed technologies alleged cultural neutrality in their accounting of form? Part of the privileged epistemology of technology is, as Marquet points out, that its, quote, practical effectiveness exempts it from sociological or other forms of explanation. But what then, if a te technology has no practical effectiveness, is it still exempt? What do such artifacts or such explanada do to the explanatory enterprise of technology's delivery of scientific truthfulness? And what do they do in terms of the epistemological duties in the explanatory enterprise of the architect? Architects being, as we know, kind of hooked on explanation. 
The relations between explanatory truth and truth are often inversely proportional. The more complex the phenomena, the more minimal the explanatory model. But it is by definition in the nature of error to resist the reductive modeling employed in the name of precision. Conversely, we might intuit that the more reductive the explanatory model, the greater the fear of error in the matter to which it attends. So I want now to look um, at another case of architecture's export of minimal modeling, and that the architects have a surprising role in the installation of its corrective power in the miniature and ultimately in code. And I want to do this by looking at two supremely unfashionable architects. One is Edwin Lutyens over here, the last Victorian architect, and the other is um, Schrodinger over here. He's the person looking very sober and uncomfortable in the bottom corner, um, who I'm going to declare as the first um, digital architect, or cybernetic architect at least, although he probably wouldn't have liked that. Both strangely stranded out of their time in the first decades of the 20th century, both engaged in projects of unparalleled colonial ambition, both of which ultimately failed, and both struggling with entropy and its scalar relations to error. It is, of course, in the explanatory models that surround reproduction, architecture, and other, that we find the fear of error and its mechanisms for its control most elaborately and ruthlessly deployed. So how living things copied is a kind of veritable engine of kind of linguistic tropes and kind of metaphoric diversions. Any elaboration of error in architecture must inevitably address entropy and the anti-entropic duties of the architect, and nowhere has the role of entropy become more scrutinized than the apparently entropy-free business of reproduction. So it was this that brought physicist um, Schrodinger, as we know, with his formulation of negative entropy to genetics and thus to the microscopic. But where Hooke had found the horror of error, Schrodinger found or installed, shall we say, order immune from the error of entropy. He also installed the architect. And so this is from What is Life, 1944, um, Schrodinger's famous lectures in Dublin. It is these chromosomes that contain some kind of code script of the entire pattern of the individual's future development and its functioning in the mature state. But the term code script is, of course, too narrow. The chromosome structures are at the same time instrumental in bringing about the developments they foreshadow. They are the law code and the executive power. Or, to use another simile, they are the architect's plan, builder's craft in one. I still find the statement utterly breathtaking. They are the law, its delivery and execution, instruction and process. They are also all future development, and he names them architect. Schrodinger's choice of word architect to describe the centralized authority of the chromosome and the causal linearity it secures in his gene action theory betrayed his struggle with the assignment of the precarious transmission of a species genetic blueprint and archive, for that matter, via mere matter. An anxiety he correctly assigned that architects happened to share and had developed certain strategies for managing. Only the architect is a metaphoric henchman, as opposed to, say, a conductor or a sculptor or a surgeon, with broken no ambition for matter. So what is life and its hero architect erected the rhetorical software of molecular biology, a megastructure that led, as we know, by the late 20th century life sciences eclipse of life by information, to the cybernetic space of all current architectural reproduction. This architect was the regulations, the standards and specifications, the drawings, the contract, the construction process itself. It was also the building completed in occupation and then in demolition as the kind of breathtaking scope of this rhetorical ambition scripted in cradle to grave biography. The gene was thus made the site of all encompassing fundamental animating force. This astonishingly, with no idea how chromosomes actually did any of this, how the gene actually worked. So it kind of was the black box of its day. Like Catramon, we can see type that is, quoting Catramon, the inflexible rule that redresses all depraved customs, all vicious errors that are the inevitable result of blind routine and successive imitation, i.e., copying. The gene, too, was constructed as both law and generative engine, whose exact workings were kind of nonetheless always strategically vague. 
And it's interesting to remember that um, Tony Vidler in in writing on wool, so that's in the 1980s, and such an interesting relation to the genome project. But he uses gene, to, he uses the gene to explain the nefariousness of the type back to the architect. So this kind of metaphoric traffic is just kind of carrying on back and forth. Like all enduring epistemological narratives, gene action as it ascended to the state of unchallenged orthodoxy, as Arwen Lewontin describes it, excluded all other lines of inquiry, excluded, excluded kind of questions even before they could be asked, like what might be the role of the whole rest of the cell matter? Or could it not be feeding information back up the causal chain? And there it remained, unmoved by all contrary experimental evidence. Until the intervention of cybernetics, until the 1970s, that is, despite the fact that evidence for cytoplasmic or maternal effects have been accumulating since the 1930s. In a sense, like the uncorroborated tests from the, from the protests coming up from the workshop floors of aeronautical engineering, these two had been, all this kind of evidence that was coming up against gene action had been shot down by the metaphoric arsenal. Um, so the primacy of the gene, not unlike the primacy of metal, was deemed obvious. The unidirectional executive authority of genes must direct everything, just as aircraft must be made metal and couldn't possibly go back to being wood. Only they ensured an error-free reality. But this rhetorical house of Schrodinger's, built with what Derrida would call the logic of contamination and the contamination of logic, hit a fault line deep within its architecture. As we now know, it was to be undone by difference and feedback. But this fault line Schrodinger had himself installed, unwittingly perhaps, when he introduced the term code in order to account for the scalar paradox of how so little material could direct so much. That is, paradoxically, when he tried to deny his uber architect a material footprint, did he set the trap of this architect's own undoing? Schrodinger's chromosome, being almost matterless, and thus, in a sense, as Aristotle would agree, pure form, was not subject to a second law, second law of thermodynamics. Only the architect gene with his plan could deliver and institute this diplomatic immunity from entropic existence. Only the architect gene has, in Schrodinger's words, quoting Schrodinger, the astonishing gift of concentrating a stream of order on itself and thus escaping the decay into a atomic chaos of drinking orderliness. So this architect almost, almost kind of doesn't need precision because precision, it attracts order and repels error. As it, quoting Schrodinger again, maintains itself by sucking orderliness from its environment. So I mean, listen to this kind of language, sucking, feeding, drinking, and these kind of linguistic tropes are hard at work. Food, it seems, both literal and metaphoric, was at the heart of the matter. We eat ourselves back into order, stripping our plates not only of calories, but of organization too, of negative entropy itself. In the same few years that the splitting of developmental biology from genetics, so genotype from phenotype from genotype, was opening up the power vacuum that ultimately Schrodinger's immaterial architecture, a scalar inversion of colonized. But in an altogether different era, Edwin Lutyens was working on two houses, one that's, as it says there, three quarters of a mile wide, and the other one here that is four feet wide. Both, not unlike Schrodinger's enterprise, consisted of vast projects of unparalleled imperial control. Both were ultimately doomed ventures. The Viceroy's Palace on the 80 mile wide site in Delhi, in, in, incredible scale of that site, was a last desperate attempt to control the erratic sprawling India and the soon collapsed colonial empire. Um, and Daniel Burnham reminded Lutyens as he was working on it from his deathbed, Daniel Burnham was on his deathbed, not Lutyens, a noble logical diagram once recorded will never die, which presumably was precisely what Schrodinger was working on. So two diagrams of Lutyens are important here. The first entitled, Comparing the Viceroy's House with the Palace of Versailles and the Houses of Parliament Westminster, speaks for itself. It was no modest enterprise, making it quite plain 
that this house was an engine of order in its execution, and the second, Imperial Delhi Viceroy's lower basement, demonstrates how this ordering is to resist entropy. So behind his thick basement walls, the Viceroy's house is an arsenal of kitchens, sculleries, pantries, cellars, and stores. This is a machine for converting biomass into the smooth running of an empire. And I don't know if you can read it, but it variously lists ice store, sugar, meat, dairy, bakery, wood, kitchen coal, ice making, pastry room, confectionaries, there's lots of sugar, vegetables, and so on, you get the idea. The scurrying footfalls of Maxwell's demons echo in this vast network of kitchens and stores. The organizing of meeting of the meet, organizing the meeting of food with heat or food with ice, as its dinners governed, its teas and tiffins negotiated, and its lunches quashed or dissent. So the split of more early modern genetics from embryology, that is genotype from phenotype, had split many other properties more pertinent to architecture. Form from matter, construction from materialization, linear production from more complex modes of production, and the singular author from the labor in masses. So note that Schrodinger's miniature architect is crucially solitary. It's quite different from the universal reversing army of demon subclasses of Maxwell and Thompson. Under the auspices of this divided state, the architect was to endow two more properties peculiar to architecture. Schrodinger's code script brought into existence the idea that to understand life, one needed to imagine it as code that is then able to decode itself, which is quite a tautology, and thus able to combine two potentially conflicted metaphors. But for the architect as both the law and the interpretation of the law, simultaneously embodying code and its decoder, Pose no problem whatsoever. Nor did the force of a temporal vector driving linear execution from code to material organization and ensuing zero feedback from said material. So, thus endowed, this extraordinarily minimal model extinguished any distinction between organizing and instruction. Code script meant that organism is its description. Indeed, the organism is eclipsed by its own description. All power, as we know, then, is to the code. So Lottiens, like Schrodinger, was also strangely drawn to the miniature with its promise of high definition and lower entropy. Whilst Lottiens was struggling in the heat and dust and chaos of the Viceroy's construction site, he was also designing a central exhibit to the 1924 British Empire exhibition, Queen Mary's Doll's House, seen by an unbelievable 1.5 million people. So this is kind of mass media, this little doll's house here. And like the Imperial Delhi, um, the Viceroy's house was also built to secure order within an arena of trade and resource. This doll's house, however, unlike its Leviathan counterpart, did have a fully functioning Otis elevator. It also had real Chateau Lafitte in the cellar, hot running water in the taps, soap that cleaned, marmalade that would spread, working motor cars in the garage. Tiny Rudyard Kipling and tiny cursive script in the library. Virginia Woolf said no thanks when she was asked. And HMV vinyl records that were on fully operative gramophones. So you get the idea. You know. This house is nothing like the architectural models that Lachin so loved. It is instrumental and like Schrodinger's extraordinary miniature metaphoric immaterial architecture, the doll's house that is his gene architect it carried within itself its own decoding and execution too. Schrodinger also wasn't just building metaphoric doll's houses in Dublin, but as it turns out, real ones too. In 1943, Time magazine review of his What Is Life lecture commented, what especially appeals to the Irish is Schrodinger's hobby of making tiny doll's house furniture with textiles woven on a midget Irish loom. In 1941, Desmond McNamara recalls a visit to the somewhat unusual Schrodinger household. He lived there with his wife, his mistress, and their daughter, McNamara here. He even showed me his tapestries. These striking little strips woven on a small loom in the pattern of mathematical formulae were strangely attractive and pinned to several walls like Dado. But what did these tiny woven printouts mean to Schrodinger before they became the blankets and the rugs in this miniature model of domesticity, presumably somewhat more harmonious and ordered than his own complicated home life. So this is 
the Schrodinger's house in contact with either his wife, his mistress, or his daughter there. And this is not one of his weavings, but the human genome. Jacquard, with his loom, is here, and so too is Turin with his machine. The Schrodinger did not simply make miniature things for his doll's house, but their very making must be miniaturized too, is very telling. Like Glotin's doll's house, Schrodinger's is performative too. With its loom, his pattern making affected other coded scripts that would install everything Watson and Crick needed for their own aspiring ambitions and ultimately for Norbert Weiner's plan to be sent down the telegraph wire. In Peter de Normanville's 1965 film that we saw a bit of earlier, Man and Commuter, commissioned by IBM, the imagery of domesticity and the kind of miniaturization of domesticity is again used to explain how a very small thing, in this case a microprocessor in a computer, can control a very big thing, i.e. design a city. The anthropomorphized components of the computer sit around this kind of strange table, and here we have the control unit with his clock, and this gentleman here with the glasses is the input. This lady here is memory, drawing stuff in her tray. This red-headed guy is the calculator. And the lady beyond him, this typewriter, is the output. Like a dysfunctional family endlessly passing the salt back and forth, and those cards go back and forth quite a few times. Their pedantic passing of tasks through the laborious and iterative steps is not only unintentionally deeply comic, but through its domestication of apparently linear execution of order reveals a hidden recursive spatiality. Only able to do one thing at a time, the miniature people in this counting machine take no shortcuts and they never make a mistake. Indeed, they can't. And these are drawings that Gergay Kovacs has produced in our studio of the fingerprints of the algorithm the computer uses to fake randomness, and in a sense, the drawing of the computer's failure to produce error. So this one, it's using a kind of strange 1970s plotter we've got holding. This one is using time, so the longer the pen is down, the bigger the ink block. And this is using space to kind of register these seemingly random configurations. So we're fooled. We see randomness, and hence the potential unpredictability of error where in fact there's always a predetermined, infinitely reproducible order. The only random event, error's way in, as it were, is via the materiality. So say, the way where fibers in the, piece of, in the paper, the viscosity of the ink, or the kind of hook-like tip of the pen. In Foundation of Mathematics, Wittgenstein takes 25 times 12. And following what he suspects may only be a kind of anthropolog anthropological ritual, he stacks them, there's 25 times 12, 2 times 5 is 10, but they're all carry the 1, and so on. And this all begins to feel a bit unstable. So he draws a grid of dots. He counts row by column, and then he counts column by row. So in a sense, like the little folk in the counting machine we just saw, that is still the computer, by the way, he returns to the safety of childlike counting. Row by column, column by row, they yield the same result. He can count the commutative law into existence. All is safe from the deceit of error, or is it? So while embryologists faced with the unrivaled ambitions of Schrodinger's gene, or without the metaphoric arsenal of the geneticist, they did have a material arsenal of sort. Not like the bemused technicians of the interwar aircraft workshops faced with the metaphoric arsenal of metallization. But the mutinous phenomena embryologists observed in cell life were dismissed by being rendered formless variously as white noise, random cellular movements, chance molecular events, and so on, basically as error. As late as 1992, so the Genome Project is well underway, R.C. Lewontin finds herself in this kind of seminal article here, having to out the fetishization of DNA. This is your one tip. First, DNA is not self-reproducing. Second, it makes nothing. Third, organisms are not determined by it. And if that's not emphatic enough, he then goes on, not only is DNA capable of making copies of itself, aided or unaided, it's incapable of making anything else. So you might think, finally, it's beginning to sound a bit like an architect. 
Perec, um, in Life He Uses Manual, answers Schrodinger's formal question of what is life with the performative how. The, and I don't know if you're familiar with this, um, this work by Perec, but the, on the cover of the book is the structuring device for the book, which is a one room deep sectional elevation of 11 Rue Simon Crugelier, the generator of both the novel structure but also of all of the detail. So this interface, this, 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 this device, presents the reader with an interface whose job it is, like all other interfaces, to hide the Ulipian engine under the hood, a literary machine that is shackled to a set of Hamilton algorithms, notably the Knight's nice Move. Her ex epilogue closes La Vie in the apartment of Serge Valens. This is the night's move across the apartment. Serge Valens is up there. Where Serge Valens is lying dead on his bed with a section sketched on the canvas beside him of, quoting Her ex, a block of flats which no figure now would ever come to habit. This mise en abîme of diagrams within diagrams makes it clear that this section is no normal interface. It is an algorithm too, a program, and in Valen's apartment, its course is run. The price of the error-free calculation, which those little people at the IBM dinner table guarantee, is the same looping redundancy Perec so brilliantly parodied in his lesser-known one-sentence novel, The Art and Craft of Approaching Your Head of Department to Submit a Request for a Raise. It's a catchy title. Written in 1968, the same year that Waddington coincidentally renamed DNA molecule program tape, as the computer metaphor finally stepped into the shoes vacated by the architect metaphor. So the art uses a basic inspired flowchart, here we have it, to which um, it was actually written by someone at Honeywell um, that correct added a few things like, uh, has your daughter got measles, or have you swallowed a fishbone, or not interested in your case, so you go into the wastepaper basket, or right into the wastepaper basket. And use this to write the punctuation-free, breathless iteration in extenso. The resultant text makes manifest an architecture of exquisite precision and baroque redundancy. Correct says, I not allowed myself to utter a proposition without having reflected all those that preceded. The end result is a text of 57 pages built entirely on redundancy. So the nameless underling who is subjected to the chorus of the algorithm, if yes then, do this, no then, do that, which as is the reader, by the way, as he circumperambulates, translation of Perec's Faire Autour de, the various departments, draws the reader through its looping corridors as he doggedly follows what Perec calls his syntactic connectors dodging grumpy secretaries, taking refuge at anonymous water fountains, and always waiting for the right quest moment to pop the question to Mr. X. Like IBM's demons, Perec's minion is infinitely patient, endlessly repeating the circular logic of the algorithm, exhaustive in his actions, but like his task, never exhausted. A task is completable, as the narrator of my computer reminds us, only if the program has the final command. Stop. Unlike Levy, for Explochart has no such instruction, and at page 57 we abandon him to this kind of Sisyphean doom. Never has the recursive legacy of Turing's machine, the kind of error eradicating only one thing at a time, space that underpins the only apparent simultaneity of the computer's performance, been so artfully conjured than in this miniaturized, solitary looping of a 1960s office plan. Well, La Vie, Life He Uses Manual, is a diagram that is sectional, disguised as a building. The Art of Craft is a building that is a 1960s office plan, disguised as a diagram, a flowchart. As we follow this underlings miserable hopes and pace the planet metro, planimetric vectors of his anxiety, we find that, like him and that eternal IBM salt passing family, we too have finally ascended to the border of the machine we too have become Waddington's program tape. The loop line of repetition in the art conjures um, all of this attendant redundancy. It, it is, is, of course, the invisible dominant space of now. 
the space behind all the extraordinary spaces we make in and with the computer. So that is behind the glossy renders, behind the kind of undulated facades with the kind of rank of optimized components, the exquisite 3D prints of digital fabrication, we find quite simply in the new black box of the algorithm, bureaucratic loop after all. But just as error followed life out of the gene action pan and into the cybernetic fire, so too must it follow architecture out of the causal linearity pan and into the circulatory, the circulatory, of, sorry, the circulatory nature of the regulated network. So, last two slides. Um, I want to close with the night's 23rd move on that kind of Hamilton algorithm on the facade of life, the user's manual. And it lands us in Morrow's apartment, where we find a red pig fetus, product of a private experiment to unseat DNA, and prove the contribution of cellular feedback in reproduction. And next to it, we find a doll's house, replete with clocks, encyclopedias, socks, automatic telephones, champagne bottles, and so on. It is Perec's materialized miniaturization of Bloom's dream house from Ulysses, in which, as Joyce wrote, all concurrent and consecutive ambitions coalesced. In their critique of the reductivism at play in their respective fields, Nancy Cartwright calls for more intelligent approximatory models, whereby the fundamental and the phenomenological are mediated by a negotiating model that allows feedback between the two. And Evelyn Fox Keller, in similar vein, but in, in a sense in different terms, and coming from life sciences, similarly calls for more democratic epistemic models that would challenge the cognitive authority of sustained epidemic privileges. Both are relevant to architecture now. The counting machine that is behind every digital process promises an error-free product, but how exactly are we to meet the exactitude of the computer? Furthermore, by definition, any attempt to totally eradicate error and indeed to come somehow domesticated or render it legitimate is simply missing the point. Not only will error merely become the next new thing we don't want, but also, more importantly, the very value of error is its ability to critically ambush a system from within. Two acts of exquisite precision and self erasure. And here is Via Selman's to fix an image of memory, in which she took several rocks she found in the desert, cast their bronze replicas, and then set about the process of indexically doubling the surface from one to the other to paint their twin surfaces. And over here, you probably recognize, are some of the 45 doors with their handles, not at hand level, but at eye level, in Wittgenstein's house as a machine for thinking in. But is counting safe, Wittgenstein asks. Yes, he answers. But only if the pieces don't change, if they don't change and we don't make some unintelligible mistake, or pieces disappear or get added without our noticing it. Thank you very much. Yeah. And yet within that floppiness, there's a kind of 
um, validity, almost like a sort of structural or like natural system. So that was the only one thought: was that you know, is, is there a, an emerging um, other way of thinking that's, that's outside? Yeah, sure. And my, my other thought was: if you if you think of someone like Rob Brooks, uh, robotics, he spent a lot of time trying to get a binocular robot to grab a glass of water, and he had something like seven G4s at the time under the table to try to get it to that simple operation. And finally, in great despair that he couldn't, after all his adult life, get this thing to do what a two-year-old child does instinctively, he kind of tried to back off and learn his lesson. He, he ended up with Cyclops robot with uh, touchy-feely fingers that had a floppy arm. Mm -hmm. And it would kind of guess at the position and, and then get material feedback. And that's now led to his Baxter robot. So instead of, and Baxter is, is not a precise robot to be put into place, it's a kind of popular robot we show what to do, and it, it tightens up as, as it sort of feels its way. So that's, again, that's two, yeah. two kind of uh, paradigms there. Is, is there an emergence of... Well, it sounds like there is. I mean, it's interesting, you know, uh, Perec, the Hamilton, the solution to Perec found for a five by five square, um, he describes finding it by, in French, tatonment. It's like the blind man's stick tapping. So kind of, you know, literally gropingly, I think is how it's translated. But it's actually, it's literally from French, it's the blind man's stick. And it's, it's that, it's like this kind of flopping robot hand. It's actually just working with, in a sense, a very large margin of tolerance, isn't it? It's actually not insisting on um, closing down that margin, it's actually throwing that margin open and then seeing what comes back. And um, I mean, I, this, this is really interesting what you brought up because in a sense it's exactly where one would hope we would start to go with this kind of hallucinatory capacity of the computer is actually to not lock down but actually to bring the agility of improvisation back into our production systems. And um, I mean, Mario Carpo would argue that the digital age has actually much more in common with the handcraft age than with the mechanical age. Kind of, we're starting to be able to kind of incorporate feedback much in the way that the, um, the aeronautical engineers who would be used to kind of feeling the response of the spruce, that, that particular piece of spruce in their hands, um, as opposed to kind of the just getting the piece of Jury Newman to do what Hooke's Law is saying it's going to have to do. Um, but I, I think, I think in a sense, I, I find Harper's work oversimplistic in that way. I think it's not, it's not about the kind of return to the handcraft, but it's about um, actually work, having a kind of intelligence tolerance and, and, and agility. And both, um, both Nancy Cart literally, right, literally, what Nancy Cartwright is arguing for, what Evan Cross Keller is arguing for, could be quite literally transposed into architecture. We could would well benefit from more democratic epistemic models, and we would well benefit from more intelligent structures of approximation, more intelligent models. And what you're talking about is precisely approximation, because in a sense, architects, this is what we do all the time. We're just in the business of approximating, aren't we? You know? um, so yeah. So, sort of, I sort of missed that narrative in your lecture. I mean, I know the whole lecture was about resisting this deterministic narrative, deterministic narratives, but it came off sort of as, it came off as sort of a double determinism, a deterministic narrative of the history of deterministic narratives. And I, I know that you're here and you're talking about sort of moving back into a, not, humanist is the wrong word, but what, in your response to Professor Goldthorpe, you're talking about, you know, Really, this is a gesture against that. And at how so? How is it going to be more effective? Because I sort of, I missed the gesture as instead of, I missed the gesture and sort of took it as a very wonderfully exquisite and well-researched uh, deterministic story. Determinism. You, so you, what, what was being deterministic? Well, it, it, was, it was just sort of a rattling off of, well, we have, a new understanding, and then we would contort that understanding so that it sort of 
overwhelms our ability to have a next new understanding, and then we understand that understanding is wrong. It's sort of just historical. But the historical examination was sort of a, I felt like a task by task, this happened, and then it happened again, and it happened again. But I think what you're pushing at is sort of... That's, yes, I'm sorry if that came across. That's, that's, not, that's not what, um, what I was intending. What, I, what was intended through this is a kind of critique of the reductive modeling that's at play. And um, in both the examples I gave, both with aeronautical engineering and both with the kind of Schrodinger's um, use of the kind of metaphor of architects, it's kind of an interesting moment when architecture, what architecture has exported out, or what's been imported into science from architecture, has been precisely the kind of rhetoric that facilitates this reductive modelism, this determinism as you're talking about, and the genome project is the ultimate kind of deterministic model in a way. Um, and what I'm, what I'm was hoping was coming across in the work is a critique of it. Because in a sense, if I'm promoting the idea of error, error by definition always resists minimal modeling. The more or, minimal modeling, the more, more error is going to be thrown up. I, well, I think the critique is obvious, I'm sorry. It's mm -hmm. that it, it, the critique sort of promotes the uh, narrative that the, might, the next iteration just seems inevitable that this, this cycle just seems inevitably to repeat itself, even though I don't think that's what you're... The, the, the cycle of deterministic models inevitably repeats itself. Yes, the tautology, sure. Yeah, I think unfortunately it does. Okay. I, I, think, I think we, we, I mean, the, the um, you know, it's interesting, when Waddington calls the molecule chromosome molecule, a program tape. This program tape arrives entirely on its own. You know, it doesn't arrive with programmer, with computer, with any of the other kind of systems that would necessarily accompany it. It still is this autonomous object. So for all the talk of kind of um, uh, emerge of, of kind of a feedback and the kind of um, kind of more systematized modes of production, Waddington is still seduced by the ruthlessness of causal linearity and the autonomous object arriving on its own. You know, I, I think it's, we, we, we are struggling to rid ourselves of certain nostalgic conceits. <laughs> Thank you very much.